The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Tammy Grimes. I wish there was another way of saying what I'm about to say, but I can't think of it right now. What I want to say is I just love the mysteriousness of the mystery theater. Things one can't really explain, like things that go bump in the night. Know what I mean? All right. Some people prefer murder and mayhem, but I like to be scared which is what today's story does to me, and I hope will do to you. Jarvis, do you hear something? A cry of some kind. There it is again. Do you hear that? Uh, yes, Colonel, I, I can feel it. Who's there? Who is it? Uh, uh, Colonel, something cold is creeping over me, sir. It's into my hair, and now it's gone down to my feet, sir. I, I can't move. I can't move. Our drama, The Voice That Wouldn't Die, was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Norman Rose. I shall return shortly with Act One. Today's Mystery Theater adaptation was printed in Blackwood's magazine 101 years ago. I mention this because I don't think the events you're about to hear could happen today. They just couldn't. So try to imagine a big stone house in Scotland standing on neglected parkland, thick with prickly gorse and bracken, abandoned flower beds, and tangled underbrush. At the back, a long brick wall overgrown with creepers, behind which lie the fallen ruins of a wooden house. Got the picture? Now, let's take a look at the people. Dr. Stewart, this old house was the ideal solution for my daughter and myself. When Rowena and I moved in, it was in a sorry state, as well you remember. It's been a long time since anyone lived here at Broadmoor. I've only rented it by the year. I wouldn't buy it, mind you. It needs too much done to it. The roof leaks, the plumbing leaks, doors won't close, windows won't open. But Rowena adores Scotland. More than India. I'm not surprised. There we're comfortable. I brought along a houseboy and my Indian cook, and of course Jarvis, who was my batman in the army and has taken care of us, always, and the horses. Don't tell me you brought your horses all the way from India. And why not? And they're taking to Scotland as well as they did to Simla. I've never heard of such a thing. After my wife died, I realized Rowena needed some link with her old life. And since she's been riding from the time she was six, I felt it was worth the trouble and expense to bring our horses to Scotland. Oh, a little more brandy, Doctor. Please. I wish Rowena weren't out. She knows this time of year sudden storms come up, but she insists on riding the moors for hours every day. I don't know how you Scottish stand this weather. Colonel, we've never known anything else. Well, here's your brandy. We have just the opposite weather in Simla. Intense heat. Well over a hundred degrees in the shade. Yet Rowena was out every day riding. But now that I've retired from the service, I want her to get a good education. Riding isn't everything, you know. Edinburgh is a stone's throw. She'll get a good education in any of their schools. How old is your daughter? She was just 17 when my wife died. In another three months, Rowena will be 18. Oh, will you listen to that? Uh, Miss Rowena has arrived at the stables, Colonel. I, uh, 
Well, I think you, you should know she, she's in a frightful state. Travis, don't tell me she's been in an accident. Uh, not, not that I know of, sir, but she's beside herself with fear and trembling. I, I don't know what happened to her out on the moors. She's absolutely white. The blood drained from her face, sir. <laughs> You're shaking all over. I was riding a hurricane, and it started to rain. And instead of taking the usual path, I cut through the back between the brick wall and those old ruins, the dower house. Doctor, she's fainted. I have some medication in my back. Can you carry her up to her room? Of course, yes. I'll just fetch my bag and follow you upstairs. The first room on the right. Rowena. Oh, good Lord, same thing has happened to your mother. She heard something one night. Oh, child, wake up, please. I'm awake, Father. What did Mother hear? Was it just before she died? I didn't realize you could hear me. Now, come along, let's let's stand up. Um, There we are. No, I want to know, Father. And I want you to go upstairs. You've had enough excitement for one day. We have plenty of time to talk about your mother. You never told me why she died, Father. You know, I, I never really knew. They said it was a disease peculiar to India. But it did seem to begin after she'd had some kind of shock. But she never lived to tell me what it was. Is your daughter But Oh, I thought you were going to take her upstairs. Oh, I can go up alone. There, there it is again. It was good of you to stay on, Doctor. I hope the supper was adequate. I was wondering if I shouldn't have one more look at your daughter. She was sleeping soundly before we came to the table. Good. That I shan't bother her. What I gave her to drink should give her a good night's rest. Have you any idea what could have caused such a violent outburst? I heard no more than you did. Something that happened while she was out riding. What was it you were telling her... About her mother. I haven't told her very much, actually. I suppose I shall have to one day. The very first clue we had that anything was wrong with my wife was one night when she told me she'd heard voices. Immediately she became quite feverish. He put her to bed. And she died 24 hours later. It was all quite mysterious and quite terrifying. And now, once more, voices appear to our little family. Don't you worry. It will pass just as do our Scottish storms. Right now, the skies are clear. The moon is high. The storm has blown out to sea. I feel certain it's only temporary. Dr. Stewart, something does occur to me, and perhaps you can help. Anything. Do you know of a minister in the area I might talk with? When life throws these mysterious surprises at you, it never hurts to have heaven on your side. The Reverend Moncrief lives quite near me. If he's still awake, I will stop by tonight. He is quite old, but I'll try to persuade him to pay you a visit and perhaps speak to your daughter. He's a most reassuring individual. Thank you. I would say at this moment, both Rowena and I need all the comfort and spiritual help we can get. Believe me, Reverend Moncrief, I wouldn't have disturbed you at this hour if I didn't think the situation of Colonel Mortimer and his daughter most strange. Uh, why do you say that, John? I say strange, for want of a better word. There's no doubt in my mind whatsoever the young lady is suffering from an extreme shock to her nervous system. Uh, Brought on by these voices, you said she heard. Aye. As I returned to the room, I heard her exclaim she was hearing a voice again. And she kept saying, go away, go away. Well, do you know exactly where she heard them? She was out riding, I think, somewhere near Bradmore. Uh. They've rented Broadmoor, have they? For a year, I believe. It's in terrible condition, but the colonel insists they're comfortable. 
Uh, well, it's been some time since the tragedy. You mean the Dower house at the back of the property that burned down? Of course. Coming from India, he probably hasn't yet heard anything about it in the neighborhood. Yeah, it's rather ancient history. Uh, before my time. I dare say. Uh, well, the colonel is very anxious to meet you. But I think until his daughter is well enough to get up, if you could spare the time and drop in someday soon. Well, I shall consult my calendar and I'll do the best I can. Thank you for stopping by, John. Let me in, please. Mother, let me in. Rowena, Rowena, what? Oh, you... Mother, please. Oh, Rowena, child, wake up. You're having a nightmare. Uh, what is it? Father, is that you? Of course, it's me. Are you all right? Oh, oh, I don't know. I... You were crying out in your sleep. I could hear you down the hall in my room. I was? Yes. Don't you remember? No, what was I saying? Something about your mother. Oh, can you remember exactly? Father, I'm asking you to please tell me. It's important. I don't remember exactly. I, I think it was... Let me in. Yes, that was it. I said, Mother, let me in. Yes, that's what it was. Oh, then it's true. It's all true. What is true, child? Oh, it doesn't matter, Father. Rowena, you mustn't keep thinking about your mother. No, I wasn't. I know, I know. Somehow she's still alive in your mind. What they call the unconscious. You must accept the fact that she is dead. I do. I know that. You were dreaming about her, weren't you? No, I wasn't. I don't know what I was dreaming. It's all right if you don't wish to tell me. No, there's nothing to tell. I mean, nothing I could tell you that I haven't already. Thank you for coming into my room to see if I was all right. I think I'll be able to get back to sleep now. Rowena. Yes? My darling little girl, I do love you so. You're all I've got. Yes, father. Good night. <laughs> Top of the morning to you, Colonel, sir. You're up early, sir. Good morning, Jarvis. I didn't sleep that well. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, sir. Jarvis, I've come by the stables to have a look at my daughter's horse, Hurricane. Well, uh, I'm glad you have, Colonel, sir. Uh, tell the truth. After yesterday, I I don't think he'll be much good for riding. What happened? Lamed? Let me see. Uh, yeah, this way, Colonel, sir. I... I've had to move him from his usual stall to the one at the end. You did? Uh, yes, sir. When Miss Rowena brought him in in that storm, remember, sir? He kicked up such a row, I thought he'd start a stable ride, I did. Uh, there, there, there he is, sir. Hurricane. Look at him. My lord. Oh, are you Hurricane, old boy? That's a good fellow. A second down now. Jarvis. His eyes. His eyes. Yes, you'll see the fear in them right off, don't you, sir? And it's a good 12 hours since Miss Rowena brought him back to the stables. Oh, you should have seen him then. Cambling like a leaf. I've never seen an horse throw a fit like that in my life. The fear is still in his eyes, no question. Uh, this horse, I'm telling you, sir, this horse was acting up like a runaway, as though the devil himself was behind him. He certainly doesn't look like himself. Look out, sir! Look out, stand back! He's kicking at the stall door! I hope it holds. Hurricane! Stop it! Stop it! Stand well back, sir. Stand well back. I think he's gone mad! Come for it, Colonel! I can't handle him! Sometimes it happens. A horse will lose its domesticated sense and revert to the original wild animal, feral and untamed. Fear can control almost any living creature. And something has most definitely frightened both horse and rider, Rowena. But what? We should learn more when I return shortly with Act Two. Colonel Henry 
Mortimer, recently widowed and retired from the British forces in India, has emigrated to Scotland with his daughter Rowena and settled in an old house called Broadmoor, outside of Edinburgh. Last night, Rowena returned from a ride having heard voices, which so frightened her that the local doctor had to attend to her. He is with her now. I'm perfectly all right, Doctor. I wish you'd let me get up out of bed this morning. Please, Miss Mortimer. I cannot take your pulse if you keep moving about and talking. May I ask that you lie still? Rowena, do as the doctor says. He's only trying to help. Thank you, my dear. Uh, Colonel, would you step outside the room with me for a moment? May I get up now? Uh, may she, Dr. Stewart? I'd like to have a word with your father, and then I will decide. Oh, this is so annoying. Colonel, your daughter's pulse is too fast for a young lady her age. She appears to be suppressing some form of excitement. Or terror. Possibly. It could also be some Far Eastern disease I am not familiar with that she could have picked up before you left India. The girl is too pale and has a temperature. I recommend she remain quietly until this subsides. Mm. For how long? Certainly another 48 hours. I understand, of course, and thank you again. I'll drop in to see her again tomorrow. Oh, Dr. Stewart... Is there anything in particular Rowena should or should not eat? Anything she has a mind to or an appetite for, I would say. Oh, what is the verdict, Father? Will I live or die? Now, Rowena, don't mock Dr. Stewart. Oh, he's examined me everywhere but where the trouble lies. Oh? And where is that? Inside my head. He told me that you'd better remain quiet for a day or two. Father... Before you and the doctor came in this morning, I heard Hurricane cry out in the stable. I know that horse. I've ridden him at home in Simla and here on the moors. But hearing that cry of his, he's suffering. I know what you're going to say. Yes, Hurricane is still nervy from your ride last night. But Jarvis has him back in his stall now and calmed down. Uh, that's not what I was going to say at all. I was going to say... Now, will you believe me that what scared me to death was some kind of a disembodied voice? Just one voice, not more? Just one. It seemed to surround me, and and then it was also as if it came from under the ground. I see. Can you remember where? Right outside that wrecked old house. The Dower House. Not possibly in your imagination. Oh, and hurricanes? That's my point. We both heard it at the same time. And if I hadn't reined him in hard and held on, he'd have pitched me right over his head. Rowena, you said last night the voice said distinguishable words. It did. Let me in. Let me in. All last night, I kept waking up and hearing it again. The same voice. Then at five, as soon as the cock crowed, it stopped. I never heard a thing, Rowena, and I'm two doors down from you. Oh, Father, are you saying it didn't happen because you didn't hear it? There is something unearthly out there, crying for help, and nobody seems to care. Rowena, be sensible. The rain was coming down. There was thunder and lightning, enough to frighten any horse and rider. And above all this din, you heard a voice... How can you say whether it was natural or unnatural? I don't want to talk about it anymore. It's tiring for me to keep on and on about it. Father, would you draw the curtains again so I can sleep? I can't tell you the worst part, so what's the use? Rowena, don't shut me out. I told you before what the voice said, but you chose not to repeat it. Let me in, let me in. Yes, don't you see what it means? That voice has something to do with mother, my mother. Something to do with the sudden way she died. Rowena, how can you say that? There is no connection whatsoever. Oh, isn't there? A voice cries out and I hear it. I keep hearing it all through the night. It was intended for me to hear it. Begging mother to be let in. It's the voice 
Of my own soul, Father. Don't you see? No, child, I do not. Oh, I didn't want my mother to die. My heart didn't. My soul didn't. In the morning you came and told me she had died in the night. Do you remember? Do you, Father? Yes, I do. You wouldn't get up. You remained in bed. And the next day and the next... I wouldn't get up because I wanted to die, too. Just as Mother had during the night. Oh, no. Yes, I did. I wanted to be with Mother. And so, now we have left her, buried there in Simla. But my soul must have remained with her. What I heard yesterday and all night was the voice of my own soul begging Mother to let me be with her. Oh, my darling child, don't think that. No, I mean it, Father. If it means I have to die, then I will. I heard my own soul begging Mother to take me with her. And that's why, even here, in this room, all last night, I could hear that voice saying, Mother... Mother, let me in. Rowena, let me make this compact with you. Until I have satisfied myself, it isn't somebody prowling round out there and even calling out during the night. Will you reject the idea that the voice has anything to do with your soul? Oh, oh, how can I? It's so far-fetched, really. I believe you heard a voice. But I am hoping there is a reason for it unconnected with your soul. Now, this evening, Jarvis and I will take lanterns and go out there to try to find a rational explanation. Well, at least you don't think I've made all this up. Well, why would you do that? Something has alarmed you. There is no doubt about that. And I'm certainly going to try and find out what it is. Here, Jarvis. The path is too narrow. Uh, would you like me to turn up the wicking or lantern, sir? Make it brighter? No, it's fine the way it is. I can see quite well with it. You have a good flame on yours, too. Uh, well, Colonel, Colonel, sir, which way are we heading? My daughter tells me what frightened her came from somewhere near the old dower house, that uh, ruin up ahead. Now, hold on a moment. Gloomy about here, isn't it? Wait. I think I hear something. Do you hear that sound, Jarvis? Now, Jarvis, do you feel it? As though someone was standing right there. Uh, Jarvis. Uh, uh, oh, I didn't feel it, sir. Uh, uh, Colonel, uh, I did most certainly hear it. Yes. Who's there? Uh, the Colonel. Colonel, something cold is it, creeping over me, sir. It's up into my hair and the back of my neck, and now it's gone down to my feet, sir. I can't move. It's your imagination, Travis. Let's get closer to those ruins. I suddenly realize who could be playing these games with us, Travis. Poachers. Huh? Poachers, yes. Yes, they could, sir. They're trying to make off with some of our deer or fowl or anything. After all, no one's been living at Broadmoor for quite some time. They could have spotted Rowena heading for home and she got too close to them and they pretended this ghost voice. Oh, yes, 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 that's certainly a possibility. Yes. Do you know, I've never actually come this far on the property. Wait, there's a brick wall along here somewhere, isn't there? Uh, uh, yes, Colonel, sir, separating Broadmoor from the Dower House. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd rather not set foot in that old place. Well, why not? It could be the very place the poachers hide out. Oh, no, 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 no. Not likely, sir. There's no roof. There's a few walls. Uh, I'm told the front door's still standing. It was all wood, and there's, there, there was a big fire there years ago. The, the place was practically burned down. Oh. There seems to be... Well, yes, there is. There's an opening in the wall. I'm holding my lantern as high as I can. Now, there's a house. I can see the ruins from here. Can you? Uh, but, but supposing they are in there, sir? I'm going in. 
Now, Jarvis, follow me. Keep your eyes open and your wits about you. But, sir, suppose there's a whole gang of them in there, eh? What could we just two do against them? Couldn't it wait till morning and we'll call the police? Jarvis, you don't have to follow me if you don't wish to. But I have a sick girl back at the house at this very moment. She is convinced something unearthly frightened her and her horse. Rowena is not going to get over this shock until I can prove to her what she heard is quite human and nothing to be alarmed about. What? what what's that, sir? What? Jarvis, it's an owl. Now, I'm walking in. I'm right behind you, sir. Seems silly. Pushing the front door open when one could walk through the wall. Now, hold your lantern higher, Jarvis, as I'm doing. Right, right. That's better. Well... We're inside the dower house, or what's left of it, and I can't see a living soul. What a bit of bat, sir. What? It's up, up there, hanging upside down from the rafters. Aye, ah, so there are. And I'm looking for something that doesn't fly, but walks and talks. Oh, oh Lord! There is a voice. It's real. Oh, oh heaven help us, Jarvis. Sir. Jarvis, watch what you're doing with that lantern. Oh, you dropped it and it's gone out. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, sir. What, what is it? I don't know any more than you do, Jarvis. Now, will you pick your lantern up? We need all the light here we can have. Now, pick it up and I'll light it from mine. You got it? Uh, yes, yes, uh, yes, Colonel. Say yes, sir. Now, hold it right side up. Bring it closer. Now, that moaning sound was to my right. You remain in this spot and I'll walk over there where I thought it went. Let's see. There's a stairs there. Can you see? Huh? Here, take your lantern. If it's mortal and goes up those stairs, I shall follow it. Uh, uh, can't, can't we stay together, Colonel Sir? Eh? Who are you? Jarvis, you stay right here until I come back. Pull yourself together, will you, man? Let nothing get past you. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry, sir. I can't stay down here alone. Now, I'll come with you. And if you like, we can come back here together. I'll follow you. I'll be right behind you all the way up the stairs. Oh, please, Colonel, don't ask me to remain down here alone. Is that you making that sound, Colonel, so that knocking is... No. Oh. From where I'm standing here at the top of the stairs, I'd say that knocking comes from down where we were. As if someone were knocking at the front door. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not going back down now. You hear that, Jarvis? Jarvis. Oh, the fool has fainted on the stairs. In the name of the Lord, who are you? now but that the voice speaks for what can only be an unseen and suffering spirit. The colonel has had enough investigating for one night. I can't blame him, so have I. He brings Jarvis to and manages to get the both of them back to the house. And shortly, I promise you, I'll be getting back to you with Act Three. <laughs> corner of Scotland, where a hundred years ago most people believed in ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties and things that go bump in the night, Rowena, the colonel's daughter, lies ill in bed, believing the voice of her own soul has spoken to her. Her father, the colonel, has also heard that voice. It is morning, and Dr. Stewart arrives to check on his patient. You're telling me, colonel... You and your man heard the voice. <laughs> the whole affair is unbelievable. Your patient is still asleep, so I haven't had the chance to tell her that indeed I also heard the voice. You? <laughs> Colonel, you've got an epidemic in your house. This will never do, you know, and so far as I can make out, you're in on it too. Yes, I am, Doctor. Yesterday you had some doubts about Rowena. There is nothing to doubt... I heard the same voice she did that frightened her, saying the same things. It's all true. I never thought the young lady off her head. 
She has a cerebral excitement, a fever. I don't know what you've got. I have only 15 more minutes, so I shall have to go up and see your daughter. Well, how did you find her? I regret to say, no improvement. Yet she appears quite lucid. Well, that's something. I don't know how she'll react when I tell her that both Jarvis and I heard the voice she keeps speaking of. I thought I would wait until after your visit. You don't have to wait. She elaborated on it with me. She says practically the same thing you told me. Knocking on the door. Mother, let me in. <laughs> it's an epidemic. An epidemic of seeing and believing, yes. No, a brain fever. There is no accounting for the freaks our brains are subject to. It's a delusion. It's some trick of the echoes of the winds, making noises in the deserted wreck of a house. Dr. Stewart, I invite you to come with me tonight to those abandoned ruins and judge for yourself. What good would come of it? Even if I am convinced there is somebody, something out there, even if I saw it, let alone hear it, I wouldn't believe it. You leave me with very little to say. Don't you want to know if there's any foundation to Rowena's so-called fevered imagination? All right. This evening, after my rounds, I will stop by. If you can give me a bed for the night, I'll be here by 11. Rowena. I came up to tell you last night I heard that poor voice crying out its suffering. Oh, Father. And so did Jarvis, so clearly that he fainted. Oh, no. And tonight I've persuaded Dr. Stewart himself to walk through the only standing door of the Dower House wreckage. How did you persuade him? He dismisses everything. Why do I believe it's my own soul crying out to join Mother? Because you loved her, child. Until I can prove to you who the voice is and why it suffers, you'll go on believing it. Rowena, I assure you, it is not your soul. It can't be. Then why is it haunting us? Why do I hear it over and over at night? It is not haunting us. We have invaded its home. We are haunting it. Now, I've asked Dr. Stewart to try to persuade the local reverend to come here. Oh, yes. A priest or a minister could help. My thinking exactly. Perhaps a man of the cloth can exorcise this spirit. And we'll be rid of it. How close are we to the haunted place? Anywhere around here we felt its chill and heard its voice. It's strongest by the Dower House front door. It's still standing. Imagine. It's about all that does. Nothing lives there but bats. Ah, there it is. Now we'll keep walking. It will follow us. That wouldn't be you, Colonel, making that noise. Having a little fun with me. Dr. Stewart, I swear to you I'm doing nothing to create that sound. There will be more, and worse. You'll see. Yes, of course. Why didn't I think of that before? It's some poor animal caught in a trap. Now, why don't we have a look in the bushes? Doctor, we go through this wall, right here, to the old dower house. You won't confuse the voice with an animal there. And we open the front door and walk in. Not a very pleasant place. Walk with me to the center of this room, will you? Now, as nearly as I can reconstruct it, Doctor, while you and I were in the main house waiting for Rowena's return, the storm broke, remember? And in trying to get home as quickly as possible, she rode her horse past that front door, and the sound she heard came from right here. I am patiently waiting to hear it. How long do you suppose we will have to wait? I don't know. I gather you're not interested in what you've already heard. Yes, I heard some sounds, but I'm not prepared to agree they were supernatural. You think that moaning is the voice of the wind? I'm waiting for it to say words. Oh, it will. It does. If you want my opinion... 
Nothing's going to happen. When there is a skeptical person present, tables don't rise, trumpets don't blow, pictures don't float, etc., etc. The apparatus of ghostly apparitions seems to fail when the doubting Thomas joins the group. Now, I have attended seances, spirit readings. Whenever I am present, nothing happens. I... I don't know why it's taking so long. Jarvis and I had hardly crossed the floor when we heard it. I'll wait. I said I'd give it a fair chance. This makes me look like a credulous fool, I guess. Huh. It seems as if tonight there isn't going to be any... Any manifestation? <laughs> That's what the mediums call it. No manifestations in the presence of an unbeliever. It's almost midnight. Let's give it another few minutes. Of course, of course. Take as many minutes as you care to, Colonel Mortimer. Your attitude isn't very pleasant. If my daughter wasn't doing so poorly, I don't think I'd take much more from you, Doctor. Do, do you hear that? It's coming towards us. I, I can't see a blessed thing. But do you hear it? Admit it, Doctor. You hear it. No question about it now, is there? Does it... Does it go on for long? I can't tell you. After a while of pleading with its mother, it goes away, crying and moaning. Well, that's it, I'd say. Until the next time. Well, Doctor, now what do you think? I cannot tell you what I think. Uh, let us start back to the house. So you have no opinion? Or if you have, you're keeping it to yourself? Yes, I am. Now, mind you, I do not believe a word of it. But I, uh, I cannot tell you what I think. Did you speak to the Reverend as I asked you to? Moncrief? Yes, He's going to visit you tomorrow evening. That's fine. I'm relieved to hear that. Well, what do you think he can do? Now, bear in mind, the Reverend Moncrief is not a young man. He's quite old, in fact. And he doesn't believe in witchcraft, you know. I'm glad to know that. Neither do I. I can't tell you, Reverend, how grateful I am that you came here tonight with Dr. Stewart. Yeah. Colonel Mortimer, I'm standing out here in the middle of the night to do what I can. You just place me with my lantern where you'd like me to watch and listen. Right beside this door, which, as you see, was once the Dower House's front door. Now, Doctor, if you wish to help and not mock, would you stand inside where we were last night? Certainly. In the name of science, I'll take my lantern and await the ghosts of Christmas past. Reverend Moncrief, as I told you, something seems to be crying to its mother to be let in. Now, we have all heard it, even the doctor, though he won't admit it. If indeed it is a spirit which exists between heaven and hell, I hope I shall also hear it. Heaven preserve us. Is that the creature? There is more. Is that you? Willie, if it is you, if it is not a delusion of Satan, Willie, lad, why come you here frightening them that know you not? Why come you not to me? Is it right to come here, Willie? Your mother's gone with your name on her lips. Do you think she would ever close her door on her own lad? Do you think the Lord... We'll close the door. No. No, I forbid you. I forbid you. Cry no more. Get home, you wandering spirit. Get home. Do you hear me, Willie? Me that christened you. That has struggled with you. That has wrestled you. 
for we the Lord. Oh, and her too. Poor woman. Poor woman, her. You're calling upon her. She's not here, Willie. You'll find her with the Lord. Go there and seek her. Not here. Do you hear me, Willie? Go after her there. Though it's very light, the Lord will lay you in, Willie. Take heart. If you may sob and cry after her, let it be at heaven's gate and near your poor mother's ruined door. Doctor, Dr. Stewart, we can leave the house now. There's nothing here to see anymore. Let's join the Reverend. You know, I could hear him calling out, but it was all so strange. I did not know what to make of it. Oh, careful there. It's a foot from this floor to the ground. It's all over, Doctor. The past has returned to the past. Where is the Reverend? Over there, on his knees, praying. The Reverend, do you believe the voice was a soul in purgatory? John, an old man like me is sometimes not very sure of what he believes. There is only one thing I'm certain of, and that is the loving kindness of the Lord. But how did you know who it was? Uh, how should I not recognize a person I know better, far better than I know you, John? Let us go now, and I'll tell you both who really was, and pray that at this moment he's found eternal peace. Rowena, you have no idea how good it does my heart to see you so flushed with health this morning. Oh, I don't know why, but suddenly, overnight, all my fears have gone. Last night, the Reverend Moncrief recognized the voice as that of a young man who'd been a prodigal son 50 or so years ago. His mother had been the housekeeper in the Dower House, and it suddenly died. The young man, Willie, came home the day after and threw himself against the door, begging to be let in. There was no one home but his dead mother. The family was away. The boy died at the door. It was there the Reverend found him and administered the last rites. Last night, he dispossessed the boy from earth. So it's all over. All in the past. Yes. Now, you and I must do something positive about the present. We will, Father. But I wish I could have been with you last night. When that unhappy, suffering voice that spoke to me so clearly finally found peace. Oh, I wish I had been there. The old minister had conducted a religious passage for a wandering soul. I can just see him raising his arms in the Scotch manner at the end of a Sunday service, giving benediction to the silent earth, the dark woods, and the ruins of yesterday. Upon that blessing, the colonel and his daughter will have found a new life. I shall return shortly. The unseen and the unknown have always intrigued me, and this gives me an occasion to say a few appropriate lines from Hamlet, a part which I, unfortunately, will never get to play. Be thou a spirit of heath or goblin damned, bring with the airs from heaven or blasts from hell, be thy intense wicked or charitable, thou comest in such a questionable shape but I will speak to thee. That William Shakespeare. He said everything before we even thought of it. Our cast included Norman Rose, Bernard Grant, Earl Hammond, and Maya Dillon. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a prayer. 
preview of our next tale. Suddenly, your husband recovered. My brother and Teploff didn't know what to do. That was Friday. So Peter recovered. He got out of bed, put on some clothes, and at two o'clock sat down to dinner. And then he complained of pains in the stomach. What did the murderers use? Rat poison? It's very easy to buy. The poison did not kill him. So we had to take matters into our own hands. Hands? But now he is quite dead. You swear, Gregory? How he died is between my brother and me. We both know. We shall never say. May I be the first then to say to you, long live Catherine the Second, Empress of all the Russias. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by White Westinghouse Appliance Company. This is Tommy Grimes, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.